Hello, everybody. My name is Marvin Four, and I'm the founder and general manager of Alpine Coles. Alpine Coles is a group of cycling coaches based in the Alps, specialized in coaching for sportives and grand fondos, of which the Etape du Tour is probably the most iconic of all. In this video, I'm going to explain how to train for the Etape, so let's start by taking a look at the route and the profile. It's a different route every year because it's always one of the mountain stages from that year's Tour de France. This year we're talking about stage 20. The start is in Nice and the finish on the Col de la Cuillot, 133 kilometers later and of course much higher up. Here's a map and another profile taken from Strava after our recent reconnaissance. There are 4,600 meters of climbing over four major climbs from Nice to a summit finish on the Col de la Cuillot. The Col de Brosse, the Col de Turini, the Col de la Colmian, and finally the Col de la Criole. You can find our video presenting the route on our YouTube channel. This is a very tough route with a lot of serious climbing as well as descents, two of which are long, technical and dangerous for inexperienced cyclists. So if you're not just a little apprehensive, you probably should be. It's a major physical and mental challenge and needs to be treated with respect. Before getting into the meat of it, let me take one minute to talk about our training camps or coaching camps as we prefer to call them, because all of these are designed to help you get your best result at events like the ATAP. The first one is at the end of January in the Canary Islands, where we can expect to ride in summer kit and warm sunshine while everybody else in the Northern Hemisphere is freezing. The second one is in Provence in April. The third one is a short camp in the Vosges in the east of France in May, focused on qualifying for the UCI G uh, Grand Fondo World Championships. And finally, in June, we're doing a special Etape du Tour camp, which will include a full reconnaissance of the Etape, as well as lots of skills practice. For details, please go to our website or send me an email, info at alpinecalls.com. Okay, so let's take a look at what it takes to do well at the Etape. Here are the average speeds from last year. The winner finished in 4 hours 31 at an average speed of 32.1 kilometers per hour. The first woman took 5 hours 23 at an average speed of 27.2 kilometers per hour. To be in the top 100, you needed to average better than 27.5. To be in the top 1,000, you needed better than 23.1. And to be in the top 2,500, you needed better than 20.6 kilometers per hour. And to be an official finisher, you had to do at least 10.9 kilometers per hour and finish in just over 13 hours. Well, your first reaction to this might be, well, that doesn't sound too hard. I can easily ride at 30 kilometers per hour. The problem is, what average speed can you expect on a route like this? On the left, you can see me coming up the Columbia near the end of the 2018 attack at about 10 kilometers per hour at this point where it's very steep, while on the right, you can meet, see me descending just a few minutes later at somewhere between 60 and 70 kilometers per hour. At about the same time, I did a 180 kilometer race on the flat at an average just under 40 kilometers per hour. The point is, none of these averages are much help in determining my average for the whole event. The answer for me in 2018 turned out to be about 25.3 kilometers per hour, which was about what I expected based on my performance in comparable events. So don't fall in the trap of overestimating your average speed based on what you can do in less mountainous events. The only meaningful reference is an event with similar distance and climbing. Now let's see what it takes to average a decent speed on such a course. Okay, so we're gonna get a bit technical for a moment and look at the event demands. Well, what does it take to do well at the ATAP? In physiological terms, the top three are one, a high power to weight ratio for the climbs. Two, excellent aerobic endurance. And three, a high capacity to burn fat instead of carbohydrate while you're climbing steadily. Psychologically, you need to be able to maintain your motivation and lucidity for the time it takes to finish. You need to be able to tolerate long periods of pain and discomfort, and you need to be able to stay positive and deal with setbacks and negative thoughts. The top three technical demands are excellent energy efficient climbing skills, excellent descending and cornering skills, and the ability to eat and drink while you're climbing. 
Finally, the most important tactical demand is the ability to sense and to stick to your optimum pace on the long flies. Now, coming on to your personal training plan. I have a challenge here because I don't know anything about you, you the person listening to me. The thing is, every single one of these cyclists and the 13 or 14,000 others is unique. There's no such thing as a standard training plan for the attack. It should be obvious to anyone that a 23-year-old elite rider with the goal of finishing in the top 10 will need a different plan to a 60-year-old first-timer whose only goal is to finish. However, the same argument applies across the board. There are at least five different broad levels from elite to high-level amateur cyclist to high-level endurance athlete who's new to cycling to a typical keen age grouper who's been cycling for years, and finally, a first-timer or an inexperienced cyclist. To add to this, we can uh, add the complexities of age, the time to train, and your access to the mountains. So the best training plan for you is one that's been designed with your unique strengths, limiters, objectives, context, and constraints and is constantly adapted for you when things change, as they inevitably do. So it makes no sense to provide a standard plan. The best we can do is to give you a set of guidelines and a framework for you to adapt to your own needs. Our goal is to give you the means to think carefully about the process and take responsibility for your own preparation. So with that in mind, let's look now at the guiding principles for your training plan. The first and most important principle, if you want to do well at the ATAP, is you need to make it a priority. Not only in your training, but at least, uh, but, but, but at least to some extent, uh, in your life. If this needs negotiation with your partner or your family, now's the time to do it. Next, you must be consistent. It's no use training really hard for two weeks and then doing nothing for the next two weeks, or only training on weekends, for example. You should be doing some sort of training on at least four and better five days per week. Point three, the single most important quality you need to develop is your aerobic base. Unfortunately, there are no shortcuts to this. You need to spend a lot of time on your bike, mostly at low intensity. This will create the endurance adaptations you need without adding unnecessary fatigue. This is the absolute foundation for the sport. Whether you're just starting out or you're a professional rider, you should be spending most of your time on this. I want to go into this in a bit more detail because it's often misunderstood. So why ride at low intensity? Surely if you want to ride faster, you should train faster. Well, it's not so simple. The key point is you get all the aerobic adaptations you need at low intensity and making every ride as hard as you can is a very ineffective way to train for an event like the ATAP for at least two reasons. One, you're training your body to rely on carbohydrate for fuel if you ride at high intensity, which is inherently limiting, as we'll see shortly. And two, you're limiting your ability to build your aerobic base because of all the extra fatigue. It will work when you first start cycling, but you'll soon hit a plateau. This chart shows the percent of time spent training at different intensities with one being very easy and seven being close to all out. There are two contrasting training approaches that we see all the time in the red, by the red bars and the blue bars. Most beginners and indeed many club uh, cyclists train something like the blue bars on this chart with most of their time spent riding moderately hard in zones three and four which is basically, basically means they ride as hard as they can manage for one to two or three hours. It's now been shown that it's more effective to, the vast, to do the vast majority of your training at high volume and low intensity, combined with a small amount at high intensity. This is called polarized training, and, it's, uh, sim and you can see it on the chart as being the red bar. So the great majority in zone one and two and a little bit in zone five, six, and, and maybe seven. To do polarized training right, you need to be clear on the zones. So here's a very simple three zone model, which is all you really need. Before we had seven, now we've reduced it down to three. 
The most important zone boundary is between Z1 and Z2 on these three zones, uh, the moderate and the heavy zones. It's called LT1, the first lactate threshold, and it's the point at which the lactate concentration in your blood begins to increase as you do more work and use more oxygen. In a five or seven zone model, this the moderate zone is split into uh, into two zones, zone one and zone two. So we're we're talking in a in a five or seven zone model about the near the top of zone two. Here it's near the top of zone one. So you should do the majority of your training at or below this point. So of course the question is how do you determine that point? Well, you determine LLT1. The best way is with a lab test where they measure the lactate concentration in your blood while you increase the load by steps. This is, however, expensive and not always easy to find. So an easy alternative is to try to talk with your riding buddy. If you can't carry out a normal conversation with no real effort, you're riding too hard. Believe me. This will probably take place at a much lower intensity than you think. For most people, it's no more than 60, perhaps 65% of their maximum heart rate or, or of their FTP, and it may well be lower still. If in doubt, go lower. It's not going to do any harm. Back to our list of general principles. The fourth principle is to increase the load progressively from one day or one week to the next, and then from one month to the next. If you're currently only training three hours a week, and you want to increase this to 10 hours a week, which is a good target, you should take at least a month to get there because your body needs the time to adapt. It doesn't mean you can't do a week of a training camp where you suddenly go to six or seven hours a day, but that's just one week. And when you get back, you'll be back to normal. The point is you cannot go to six or seven hours a day uh, and stay like that for, for, for weeks on end. The fifth, whoops, the fifth point is to never, you must never lose fight, sight of the fact that your body only gets stronger when you rest and recover, okay? Training breaks you down and creates the stimulus needed, but you only get stronger during recovery. But it's really important to allow your body the time it needs to adapt and get stronger. The sixth principle is to do as much climbing as possible. By the time you get to June, you should be doing at least 2,600 meters in a single ride. Vary the intensity on your climbs. If you attack every climb in your training as hard as you can, you'll build mainly fatigue, not fitness. So as you get closer to the event, you should do some of the climbs at race pace, especially towards the end of your rides. But if, if you, but most of the time, you should be doing them at a, at, a, at a steady, low pace. If you live in a flat area, Obviously, you can't climb easily. Your options are, one, do hill repeats on whatever you can find nearby, even if it's just short. Two, travel to find some climbs. Or three, use a smart trainer linked to an app which will simulate the climbs for you. Seventh principle, develop your technical skills. This is especially important if your bike handling and descending skills are not great because you're running a pretty high risk of having an accident. Road cycling at speed and in groups, especially in the mountains, is a highly technical and skillful sport, and it takes many hours of deliberate practice before you can participate safely in an event such as the attack. Number eight, develop your fat burning or your fat oxidation capacity. This probably also needs some explanation to understand why it's important. Our bodies have two possible sources for energy basically carbohydrates or fat. There are important differences between the two. Your body can only store about 2000 calories of energy from carbohydrates in the form of glycogen, whereas it can store at least 50,000 calories in the form of fat. This means that we have an engine that can burn two different types of fuel, but we only have a small tank of one type of fuel, while there's a huge tank of the other. Now, this wouldn't matter at all if the two types of fuel were completely interchangeable, but of course they're not. Fat is very good for fueling work at low intensity and a steady pace, but it's no good for fueling high intensity and high power because the oxidation rate is too slow, very simply. Only carbohydrate can fuel high power, high intensity. 
you, so you can think of carbohydrate as working a bit like an afterburner on a jet fighter. It provides a huge boost in power, but it burns through the fuel very quickly. So your time at high power is very limited. You simply can't eat and digest anywhere near enough carbs when you're riding at high intensity and to replace what you're burning. So there's therefore a huge advantage if you can burn a high percentage of fat at race pace, because if you're conserving glycogen, because then you're conserving glycogen for, for the hardest efforts only when you, when you, when you want to attack or, or, uh, or, or, or catch someone up or whatever it may be. As you can see from the chart taken from a research study measuring the variations in fat oxidation on a population of trained athletes, even amongst trained athletes, the variations are huge, with fat oxidation ranging from almost 100% at rest to only 20%. So it's hard to overemphasize the value of being able to get the majority of your energy from fat at race pace. In a nutshell, it means you can go harder for longer without running out of energy. The good news is that this is trainable because the variations are largely determined by what and how you eat and uh, connected with your training. So we'll come back to this in a few minutes when we get to nutrition. Back to our guiding principles. The ninth and last of these is to monitor your readiness for high load. This is important because research over the last few years has shown that training hard only has a positive effect if your body is in a state to benefit from it. So let's look at how we can monitor this. The issue is that recovery and adaptation is inhibited by stress, whether it be training stress or life stress or both. All this stress forces your body to secrete various hormones, such as adrenaline and cortisol, that are needed to manage the stress, but which also inhibit your training adaptation. So if you're in the habit of coming home after a very stressful day at work and immediately jumping on your turbo trainer for a brutal interval session, you should be aware that you might feel psychologically a bit better, but the training value was almost certainly close to zero because you've just added more catabolic hormones to your bloodstream when what you actually need to take advantage of the training stress are anabolic hormones. So it would actually be far better to do a gentle zone one session, which eliminates the stress hormones and gives a chance to your parasympathetic nervous system to start working. So how do you know if you're ready for a high intensity session? Well, there are three key indicators you can work with. The first is to figure out how much stress you're under. You can estimate this, of course, by paying attention to your feelings and to what you know about the stress, or you can measure it using resting heart rate and heart rate variability. But this is only useful if one, you do it every day, so you know what a normal reading is for you, and two, if you take the time to learn how to interpret the values, because it's not totally obvious. The second indicator is the state of your muscles, and especially how much fatigue or soreness do you feel in them? The third only applies if you're training hard day after day for an extended period, as, uh, as so-called submaximal fatigue tests will tell you if the glycogen stores in your muscles have recovered or not. This isn't the moment to go into all this in detail. Let me just summarize that you should do a high intensity workout only when you have low stress, low fatigue, and no muscle soreness. If you want to know more, you can do a Google search or find articles on our blog about, about these issues. All right, so now we've talked about the general principles. Let's take a look at the training plan framework. It includes three phases or periods. First one is preparation, where you prepare your body for an increased training load and develop your aerobic and fat burning capacities. The second is the pre-competition phase, where you add training stress to sharpen yourself up for the actual event. And finally, the, the competition or taper phase where you reduce the fatigue without losing any fitness. Here you can see our framework training plan, which you can download from our website under the blog section, or just send me an email at info at alpinecoles.com to request it. It's a framework and not a detailed day-by-day -day training plan for the reasons I, I explained at the beginning. The idea is that if you understand the reasoning and the rationale you can design your own training plan that's perfectly tailored for you. I'm not going to go through the plan in detail. Let me just highlight the structure a little bit. The first page we're looking at here tells you what to focus on during each period and why. And there's a second page with suggested workouts for each period. 
Each phase is broken down into four week cycles, including three load weeks and one recovery week with a target training load for each week. That's the, the pink um, squares in, in the middle left. If you're over 50, be aware there's some evidence that adopting a three week cycle of two load weeks and one recovery week might be beneficial rather than going for four weeks. Here's the second page, and this page provides you with a typical training week and suggested workouts during each period. The harder you intend to race, the more you need to do in terms of intervals and high intensity, but it should never be more than two sessions per week. If you're less experienced and your objective is simply to finish, you should focus on building your aerobic capacity through volume, meaning lots of kilometers and lots of climbing. Always making sure that you're, you're not exhausting yourself and you're able to give yourself enough time to recover. By all means, have fun from time to time attacking short hills or sprinting for road signs, but not too often, and don't try to do lots of structured sessions. These will detract from the priority um, if, if you're relatively inexperienced. So how do you take that framework and customize it for you? Well, it's best to be pragmatic and start with your constraints, especially your training time availability. So be realistic here, um, you know, make yourself a table, but confirm it with your partner and family, which because that could save an awful lot of misunderstandings and arguments later on. Which days of the week can you train and for how long? What are the family or work commitments that will prevent you from training on certain days or weeks uh, during the next six months? Once you've sort this, thought this through, you can block off week by week the training time you'll have available. You'll probably end up with something that's quite a long way from ideal, because we all do, it can't be helped. Adjust things as much as you can to respect the principles of increasing the training load, followed by recovery in three or four week cycles. Now let's take a look at what should be in part one of your training plan. So this is the first three months, the preparation phase, which runs from now until the end of March. The key objectives or focus during this period are one, to build the ability to train for 10 to 12 hours or more per week and to ride long distances without undue fatigue. Two, and really as part of the first objective, to build your fat burning capacity. These first two are the 80 to 90% of your training uh, sessions. Okay. The 10 to 20% is to build strength and neuromuscular capacity. The neuromuscular part is a higher priority for faster riders than slower ones, but building strength is important for everybody. Finally, include some exercises to work on technical skills, such as descending and cornering at speed. So those are the objectives and the focus. Now let's look at how to do it. Here's our recommendation for a typical loading week in the preparation phase. The rides are in order of priority. There's no shortcut to developing your aerobic endurance. You need to ride as much as possible to progress to five and then six hour rides at low intensity. But don't fall into the temptation of riding faster. Remember these rides are supposed to be slow for the reasons we discussed earlier. Make sure you can talk comfortably from beginning to end of the ride. So at least 80% of your training should be like this, as I just said, so which is why the second ride should also be a long, low intensity ride, a bit shorter than the first. If the weather forces you to do these indoors or on a, on a turbo, you can reduce the time by 20 to 30% to account for the lack of freewheeling or micro breaks. The third session is an interval session, typically of one to one and a half hours. Let's take a look at uh, what this could be. We could discuss forever on which are the best interval sessions. Apart from the obvious, which is that they should be aligned at least to some extent on, on, on an effort that you can expect during the race, the research so far hasn't identified a magic bullet. The ones I'm showing you here are two by 10 minutes with five minutes easy. Second ones are four by eight minutes with three minutes easy. And the third ones are eight by four minutes with two minutes easy. They will definitely work, but if you tell me you prefer something slightly different, I'm not gonna argue, go for it. Choose the intensity level so that you can complete the session. If you haven't done any intervals for a while, I suggest starting at a moderate intensity, so quite a bit below your FTP. Over a four to six week period, you can work up to higher intensities or longer periods at the same intensity. The other question is the cadence. 
My suggestion is to vary the cadence between sessions, but probably not during a session at this time of year. Assuming you're doing two per week, you could do one session at high cadence and the other at low cadence. What does this mean? It depends on you, but high would be above 80 revs per minute and low would be below 60 RPM. Be aware that at any given power, it will feel harder at high cadence and your heart rate will be higher. A few things to remember when you're doing intervals, warm up very well before the first interval, at least 15 minutes, really 20 to 30 is better. Remember that these are as much about pain tolerance as anything else, so they are supposed to hurt. However, it is not a good idea, at least during this phase, to completely empty the tank. Uh, it's better to stop with one interval left in reserve. So pain, yes, but not excruciating and not to the point where you fall off your bike. Now, in most cases, your fourth session should be a third low intensity run. Some may be tempted to do a second interval session. This could be a good idea if you're very strong, but if you do it, it's really important that your long rides are at low intensity. Otherwise, your training load will be too high and you'll sooner or later end up in a bad place. I know I'm repeating myself, but, but too many people make this mistake. If you're going to do, a two, in if you're going to do two interval sessions a week, it's, it's absolutely essential that the long rides are really at low intensity. So remember that hard training creates the stimulus to get stronger, but your body only actually rebuilds and gets stronger when you give it the chance to recover. So only do a fifth training ride, even a recovery ride, if you're really feeling good and all the indicators are green. A reminder of the importance of technical skills. During the attack, you're going to have to descend almost as much as you climb. So you need the skills and experience to manage steep, dangerous alpine descent. This is where most of the accidents occur. So if you want to stay safe, you better learn these skills. There's no alternative to practice. You can learn the theory in a book or by watching a video, but the only way to build your skills is on the book, is on the, on the bike, on real descent. It's similar to skiing. Almost everybody who comes to the Alps to ski for the first time takes lessons. If people did the same for cycling, there'd be far fewer accidents. If you can join one of our camps, we'll be happy to teach you. Otherwise, make sure you get enough practice somehow. Now, let's talk about how to use your nutrition strategically to achieve three objectives. The first one is quite simply to fuel your training load so that you're eating exactly what you need, but no more. The second one is to achieve your desired weight, which may or may not mean losing a few kilograms or more rarely adding muscle. And the third is to optimize your ability to burn fat. Remember this last objective is essential in order to fuel the long efforts at tempo or perhaps even close to threshold pace that you have to make uh, to do well at the attack. Achieving these three objectives together means you need to adjust your total calories consumed to be equivalent or slightly below the calories you're burning while adjusting the relative amount of carbs and fat you eat to correspond to your training load. The basic idea is to train your body to use fat for its base load and low intensity training and only use carbs when you need them at high intensity. And let's see how to do that in practice. The first point is you should vary how much you eat day by day depending on your daily energy expenditure, which of course depends on how much you're training on that day. Put simply, on a rest or recovery day, you should eat a lot less than a hard training day. On the day in the picture, we rode 120 kilometers around Mont Ventoux, so it was pretty hard day and we enjoyed lots of carbs. So varying how much you eat according to your training load will help you achieve and maintain your target weight. But this alone isn't going to have any impact on your ability to burn fat. For that, you need to encourage your body to burn fat preferentially to carbohydrate, which means keeping your carb intake low, except on the days when you really need it. So ideally, you should be consuming next to no carbohydrates on days when you're not training at all and very little on a recovery day. You only actually need the carbs on a loading day when you might be doing a set of high intensity intervals or on a long ride day when you might be doing a ride of, of five hours or more. So finally, you should avoid industrial food and as much as possible eat a wide uh, variety 
of only high quality natural food. Let's look at some examples. In terms of carbohydrates, you should prefer the most natural, high quality and complex varieties such as fruit and vegetables, lentils, beans, pulses, nuts, and so on. Avoid sugar in all its refined forms. And remember, lots of it is hidden in cakes and biscuits. The only exception to this is on a big day on the bike where the sheer quantity of carbs that you need to consume means you're more or less forced to use sports nutrition and especially energy drinks. You shouldn't need to use sports in, uh, nutrition during a one hour interval session or indeed any ride less than two or three hours. In terms of fat, you should look for the highest quality natural forms, more vegetable than animal, good sources of things like avocados, hard cheeses, olives and olive oil, nuts and seeds, uh, and also coconuts, coconut oil, oily fish like salmon, sardines, mackerel, trout, tuna, etc., whole fat yogurt, eggs, and of course, dark chocolate in moderation, obviously. And then last but not least is protein. But here too, it's important to choose based on the quality. You should be eating at least 1.6 and up to two grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. And what you should be looking for, of course, is lean meat, poultry, fish, cheese, Greek yogurt are all good sources of animal uh, protein, as well as vegetable proteins that you can find in lentils, beans, cereals, nuts, tofu, chickpeas, oats, wild rice, and wild rice, and all sorts of other things. So that's it for the nutrition. Now, we're almost finished, but before we do, we still have to mention an unpopular subject. If you want to ride fast and hard, you're going to have to push harder on the pedals, which means stronger muscles. Sadly for us cyclists, the best way to strengthen our muscles is off the bike. Even low cadence, high torque intervals won't help much. So to develop leg and core strength, you should plan on one or two sessions per week, ideally guided by a strength and conditioning coach with experience in cycling. The goal at this time of year is to increase the strength of your leg and core muscles. If you're new to this, be cautious to limit the risk of injury. The most basic exercises are squats, lunges, planks, bridges, bicycle kicks, and roll downs, but there are many more which can be beneficial. The key is to learn the proper technique. Believe me, I'm speaking from experience, I've injured myself by poor technique. Mobility and flexibility. This is equally important to building strength. You should plan on two to three 20 minute sessions per week to develop your mobility. Pilates or yoga can be extremely beneficial. Again, learning correct technique is vital. So choose a practitioner who, who, who knows cycling and only takes small groups or better still individuals. Complement uh, these occasionally with other sports, walking, running, swimming, etc. The reason is if cycling is your only sport, you risk building up Im imbalances and soft tissue problems over time. So it's really important to, uh, to, to vary your sports uh, a little bit. That's it. So I've given you the principles and guidelines that should allow you to prepare yourself between now and the end of March. I'll post another video before then to talk about part two, the pre-competition period. In the meantime, it's up to you. Take the principles, create your own training plan, and then follow it. If you'd like professional help to be at your absolute best on July the 7th, we'd be delighted to help you. We can do so in a couple of different ways. Firstly, join one of our coaching camps for a big block of training, as well as one-on-one -on -one coaching on your technical skills, and of course, plenty of advice and tips for your preparation and for the event itself. Or you can sign up for a six-month coaching agreement to receive individual day-to-day -day coaching and one-on-one -on -one advice. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always send me an email, info at alpinecalls.com, and I'll be very happy to, to, uh, to, to reply. So thanks for listening. Good luck with your training, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Bye now.